as Su Ling said, these events are, uh, we really do need some great sponsors to step up and uh, support this event. Uh, this next uh, organization, when I think of them, they're not always kind of top of mind, except when I have to pay my heating bill. Uh, but they, they have a tremendous amount of infrastructure uh, in our city. You've heard before, we're one of the coldest uh, capital cities in the world. So we're very happy to have as our lead sponsor, Enbridge. And uh, to introduce our next speaker, please welcome the manager of regional construction for Eastern Region Enbridge. Here is Jeremy Miller. Thank you. Oh. And I think I was just, when I was sitting down there looking at the Enbridge banner up on the, on the sign, I, I was looking at it and I know Su Ling said this morning, Enbridge Gas, is that right? Is it Enbridge Ottawa? Is it Enbridge, what is it? An interesting thing about our name Enbridge, it's actually two words. It's energy bridge. So it's the energy bridge that Enbridge will bring to the, your communities with, with your needs. So that's not part of my speech and I was told to stick to the speech, but uh, I will do that. So good morning everyone, my name is Jeremy Meller and I've, uh, Pleased to be here on behalf of Enbridge Gas. Thank you to the Ottawa Board of Trade and the OBJ uh, for putting such an engaging agenda focused on the future of our city. For bringing together business leaders, community leaders, diverse leaders and partners, like what we saw this morning, that was incredible. We've said this before, we all have a role to build and care for this community. And, to do, and, and for us, the meeting bringing people together and talking. Talking about the city, talking about issues, chart a path for the future, which is why we are so pleased to be a sponsor of the City Building, city building Summit. We are proud to be part of the fabric of the thriving community. We provide natural gas to more than 389,000 customers through about 4,700 kilometers of pipeline in the city. As one of the city's largest infrastructure owners, we contribute more than $5 million in taxes to the city every year. We pay for taxes on every meter of pipe that we have and every asset that we have in the city. We're also proud to support many community causes from Chrissy Lake Kids, Winterlude, Food Banks, Ottawa Mission, and many, many more in between. Ottawa is growing. It's our role to ensure we have a safe and reliable energy to fuel the economy, developments, and the uh, what we see locally. And to meet the energy needs, we're making significant investments in the city. And while we work to ensure we meet the current and future energy needs, we also have to be very focused on the energy transition and the net zero economy. Our business is evolving to support and uh, our own operations for, or, uh, I'm going to start that again. Our business is evolving to support our own operational net zero targets, as well as supporting the targets of the communities that we, we work in and we serve in. We are pleased to be working closely with the City of Ottawa and Ottawa Hydro, which I see over here, on the coordinated energy planning and have regular conversations about how we work together to plan for Ottawa's needs and developing solutions and climate actions. You may ask yourself why Enbridge is working on energy transition. Well, it's a reality. We are an energy company, and as an energy company, we are focused on the collective energy future. We continue to advocate for pipes and wires approach to the energy transition to achieving net zero energy emissions. As Ottawa continues to grow, new businesses and homes need reliable, affordable energy. Energy that is not available, uh, energy that is available now and energy that will be available for years to come. Enbridge Gas is focused on meeting these goals, and we believe, we believe growth and climate action can complement each other. Case in point, I almost went to the wrong page. Case in point, Ontario's extensive pipeline infrastructure can be harnessed to meet our current energy demands as well as future climate objectives. For example, our network of pipeline assets can be used to embrace low carbon home heating technologies like hybrid heating, and can also deliver low carbon fuels such as renewable natural gas and hydrogen. The leaders in the room are fun, uh, foundational to the thoughtful energy transition, one that is effective, well planned and measured. As change makers, you bring ideas and pilot programs to life. I want to thank you for your continued leadership and partnership. Thank you for continuing to be a passionate, enthusiastic as, about the city as we are. On that note, it is now my great pleasure to introduce someone with a wealth of knowledge and experience in this area. Michael Cleland, an executive in residence with the University of Ottawa Positive Energy Program. Mr. Cleland is a private consultant with extensive experience in energy and environmental policies. He is an executive, like I said, in the residence at the University of Ottawa. He's a past chair of the board of directors of the Canadian Energy Research Institute 
past chair of the Board of Directors for Quest, which is the Quality Urban Energy Systems of Tomorrow, and a senior fellow with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. He has served as President and CEO of the Canadian Gas Association and Senior Vice President, Government Affairs for Canadian Electrical Association. He has served in several roles with the federal government, including Assistant Deputy Minister, Energy Sector in the Department of Natural Resources Canada. So before doing all this, before joining the government, Mr. Cleland worked in several capacities in Nova Scotia as an independent consultant at Dalhousie University and in the government of Nova Scotia. He was educated at the University of British Columbia in political science and then at Queen's with a master's in urban and regional planning. Over to you, Michael, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, um, actually for, uh, for giving my speech. Um, so I can keep it really short, but uh, and it isn't just because of my past association with the gas industry that we're, Jeremy, and I, Jeremy and I probably agree on a lot of things. I think because uh, if we all look carefully at this, we'll find that there's uh, lots of common sense to be found uh, in, in practical solutions to the, uh, to the energy transition. So thank you for the invitation to speak about what I've called the low carbon uh, energy transition. And note that I've said low carbon, not zero. Under most net zero scenarios by 2050, and if you look at this for Canada, for example, the Canada Energy Regulator, uh, the goal is only achieved with a significant contribution from offsetting activities, much of which is really only relevant at the national or provincial level. So in other words, the challenge, I think, for the cities such as Ottawa is how to radically reduce emissions by 2050, not necessarily to eliminate all of them. So my message to you this morning concerns what business should be doing, how to evaluate government strategies, how to constructively critique those strategies, and how to make smart things happen. Uh, Jeremy talked about some of my credentials, but I want to refer again to uh, some organizations that I've been working with, uh, Positive Energy at the University of Ottawa, whose focus is, is essentially on the institutions that uh, govern energy decision making in Canada uh, and how we ensure that there is public, investor, consumer and citizen confidence uh, in those, uh, in those uh, institutions. Uh, Jeremy mentioned Quest, where I was at both in the past the chair. Um, Quest's mission is to help communities devise strategies and plans for reducing emissions. And then finally, I've also recently completed uh, some work for a group called Energy for a Secure Future, looking in detail at the demand side of Canada's energy future. I mention these organizations because their work could be helpful to your future deliberations on the subject, and all are easily found on the, uh, on the internet. And if you want, I can help you give you more of a steer. Um, the subject, of course, is huge, and I can cover only a few small aspects in the time available. So, th so think of what I'm going to say as a series of related but separate themes uh, that are foundational to good energy policy. Start with scale, scope, and pace of change. The scale of the challenge, the net zero challenge for Canada, is bigger than anything public policy has had to deal with in our lifetimes. It is an energy revolution on the scale of the three big energy revolutions of the 19th and early 20th centuries, but this one driven by public policy. But scale only tells us so much. The scope extends to every corner of the economy and society from energy production to energy use. So it's about big corporations, institutions like hospitals and universities, small businesses, and you and me in our homes and our cars. In other words, it is extremely complex and will in the end depend not just on technology, energy pricing and regulation, but on the very unpredictable thing we call human behavior. This should tell us something about the pace of change. Canada has agreed with the world community that we need to achieve enormous change in our emissions in about 25 years. But what we feel we should do is not the same as what we practically can do. Think of it this way, from 1991 to 2005, which is the baseline for our current targets, 
Canadian emissions grew from about 600 megatons of carbon of greenhouse gases uh, to 730 megatons. During that time, uh, or during the time uh, since uh, 2005, we have seen two significant downturns. One associated with the 2008-2009 recession, uh, another most, more recently with COVID. But the long-term story so far is slow growth and then stability, not yet enduring reductions. So we've got a steep hill to climb here. Our official target uh, for 2030, six years from now, means we would have to lose about 300 megatons. Think of that, 300 out of the, seven, out of the 730. Uh, about five times the net change over the past 17 years. In my estimation, it is almost certainly impossible for our physical economy to adjust that fast. So, theme one, look for policy and ask your, your city leaders and your other policy makers to look for policy that aims far enough out in the future so as to be consistent with the way that capital stock turns over, the way that communities evolve, the way investment decisions are made, and the way consumers adapt their behavior or their energy using capital. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, anything else, I would argue, is a distraction that will likely get in the way of real change by 2050. So my second theme concerns what I call the foundations of the energy economy. What I mean by the energy economy is not only energy production, transmission and distribution, but also everything we do with, with energy, with the way we use it, what do we use energy for, what are the characteristics of energy systems that make them work. Until very recently, it's a source of great frustration for a lot of people in the energy business, it has been almost impossible to get many climate policy thinkers thinking about more than greenhouse gas management. And yet something every energy analyst knows is that energy systems must be safe, secure, reliable, resilient, and affordable. Uh, we call these, at least some of us do, the energy, energy fundamentals. Let me talk about each of those a little bit in turn. Safety is something we can usually take for granted, but as new technologies uh, are, are brought on, or as old ones uh, are re returned, such as, uh, as the nuclear, and they're, and they're deployed, they are bound to, to raise uh, new fears among the public, most of them not warranted in any technical sense, but no less real socially and politically. Security more or less disappeared as a concern after the end of the oil crisis in the 1970s and the 1980s. But it was always there in the background, and it came back at us in a rush when Russia invaded Ukraine. In the future, security may well still involve commodities. It will almost certainly take the form of things like cyber attacks. And in Canada, it could uh, involve difficult water conditions on our hydro systems. Security will always matter. Reliability, the third of the fundamentals, is something we take for granted. Energy systems almost always work, despite the occasional flickering lights that most people are familiar with. But sometimes it is a much bigger deal. And I simply suggest that you ask Albertans about that, the ones who this past winter faced a perfect storm of conditions affecting their electric power systems. Resilience is going to grow as a concern as we find ourselves facing more wind storms, ice storms, wildfires, and floods. Energy systems will need to be built and operated to new standards to cope with these sorts of conditions. In other words, it is about both hardening of the systems and operational readiness. And with that, and operational readiness, I can't resist a personal story. When I was with the Canadian Electricity Association, now Electricity Canada, I once had the privilege of presenting our annual safety award to Hydro Ottawa. Many of us recall the great ice storm of 1998. During those four very, very scary days, and for long afterwards, Hydro Ottawa fought to restore power to our community under the most difficult conditions imaginable. In some cases, it took quite a while, quite a while, but it got done. And it got done with no lost time injuries to Hydro Ottawa workers. I call that resilience. And then there is affordability, something most Canadians have long had the luxury of never having to worry about. 
But then along came post-COVID inflation across the economy, and with it concerns about energy affordability, which are very, very present today in the political debate. Affordability will always be an issue, sometimes in the background, and for most people more of an irritant than a crisis. But for a low-income energy consumer or an energy-intensive business that is constantly fighting to remain competitive, it is a lot more than an irritant. Even if energy affordability declines in political salience, it will always be real for many energy users. My point here is to simply emphasize a fact that should be obvious to all of us, but has been largely ignored in a lot of the climate debate. If energy systems fail on any of the fundamentals, then public support for action on emission reduction fades far into the background, and we see that typically in public opinion surveys. And successful emission reduction can only rest on a base, a firm base, of public support. Speaking of public support, beyond energy fundamentals, there's a factor which we can call social acceptance. People in communities, and we probably all know this, often don't like new facilities, and we are going to need a lot of new facilities. Think about the fact that virtually all net zero energy outlooks for Canada see a doubling, or even as much as a tripling, of our electric power capacity by 2050. All of that in 25 years. In order to even come close to that, we need to carefully and systematically bring people and communities along. Get their buy-in. Deal with their fears. Ensure that decision processes are transparent and fair. We can accelerate approval processes, but we can only speed them up so much without losing public support. For policymakers in the City of Ottawa, most of this sort of thing will take place outside of their jurisdiction, and they consequently have little or no control. But that leads me to my third theme. Are local energy strategies rooted in a critical assessment of how much of that new electric power will actually be available and affordable when we need it? As we look at proposals to more or less eliminate natural gas systems, we should be asking whether such moves are prudent. I'm not suggesting that's happening right now today in Ottawa, but it is happening in other communities around, around Canada. My own estimation is that they are not, and if not, then what should we do? We can reduce emissions from the natural gas system, and Jeremy talked about some of this, natural gas system and its users through higher end use efficiency, through additions of renewable natural gas, and looking into the future, quite possibly hydrogen. And again, referring to Enbridge, last year Enbridge commissioned a study uh, that looked at how a mixed system built on electric, gas, and thermal networks could move Ontario decisively towards our gre greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction goals. Whether you agree with that report or not, it's worth thinking about. For those of us who insist that we need to quickly eliminate fossil fuels that is a long way from a satisfactory solution. But for those of us who rely on those existing systems for space heat, process heat, it just might make sense to think carefully before we act and to be sure that both new supplies and new end use systems are up to the job. My next theme concerns human behavior and energy and emissions prediction. Many organizations, including the City of Ottawa, have developed net zero strategies. Ottawa's strategy outlines a series of measures which are more or less what you would expect on things like transportation, housing, and commercial buildings. It all depends very heavily on electrification, and like all such strategies, it's built on modeling work. Modeling is a necessary foundation for analysis and eventually for policy, but be wary. Modeling of completely transformed energy system necessarily relies primarily on assumptions and estimates because there is limited empirical data yet available. These can be soundly based on the best available information concerning technology and investment. And as long as the assumptions are transparent, they can be useful guides. But something models are not very good at is dealing with human behavior. Good analysts are frank about this. What real people in the real world might actually do is something either entirely outside the model or, at best, subject to guesses. There's nothing new in this. 
Oil analysts going back decades have struggled to foresee future oil prices. In considerable measure, they have succeeded in foreseeing the behavior of producers. But notoriously, they have badly failed to foresee what might happen to demand. Estimates can be all over the map, and that is dealing with the demand side that is pretty well understood. As with oil, we can come up with at least plausible estimates of what new production capabilities might be able to do. But even there, we need to be cautious. I don't suppose that when people embarked on the Site C hydro production project in British Columbia that they thought it would take almost two decades and cost vastly more than the estimates. But comparing that, or comparing, compared with estimating what energy users might do, that was the easy part. Energy use in Canada involves literally millions of residential units, hundreds of thousands of commercial or institutional buildings, and millions of vehicles. Even things that seem as obvious as shifting demand to electrical, electric vehicles can vex policymakers, as we're seeing today. Battery technology has, has advanced radically, and costs are coming down. It should be possible to convert most urban transport to electric over the next couple of decades, at least from a supply side perspective. But then along come those unpredictable consumers. Many still don't believe that EVs will give them the range they need. Most are unsure how charging infrastructure will evolve so they can refuel easily and conveniently. So people, being people, will be cautious across the board. To take a different case, the City of Ottawa strategy counts for a lot of its progress on retrofitting existing building stock. That is understandable, given that most of the buildings in existence today will still be around in 2050. But most of us, whether residential or commercial owners, know that a retrofit is more complex than it looks on the surface. It may be as simple as installing a heat pump, but that can also mean a heat pump with supplemental capacity whether gas or electric resistance, to cope with those Ottawa winters that we know so well. It will also mean getting into what may be a very long queue waiting on capacity-constrained equipment installers. And for some people, it may mean a major renovation that will not only be costly, but highly disruptive. And then, of course, there is the long queue waiting for capacity-constrained building contractors to do the work. For a lot of people, all of those factors will add up to a preference for the status quo. That doesn't mean it can't be done, but it will take time. And so to my next theme, it will take capital, something that many householders and most businesses don't have a lot of just lying around. One of the inexcusable gaps to date in the net zero debate is a realistic assessment of capital costs and who will pay. It is plausible, under certain assumptions about future energy costs, that the big upfront investments will eventually pay back. But you still have to get over that capital cost hurdle. So who is going to pay? On the supply side, I can relate a story about a very small part of the puzzle. A couple of years ago, a colleague and I undertook a project on behalf of a very large power, power distribution utility in Ontario. They were trying to estimate the cost involved simply in upgrading the power distribution system to accommodate greatly increased power demand. And their thumb in the air estimate was in, let's just say, many billions of dollars. So they asked us to look at what utilities in the, in the US and Europe were estimating. We came back to the client with one very simple answer. Nobody knows. The estimates from different jurisdictions were all over the place. In short, the only thing we do know is that it won't be pocket change and that someone, ratepayers or taxpayers, will have to pay for it. For the most part, when we look at costs, we're looking at the supply side. But the demand side entails changing our energy systems throughout the economy, agriculture or other resource operations, manufacturing and processing, commercial operations, institutions and houses. Who will finance that? One thing that constantly surprises me is how often I hear from people, including business people, that governments will have to pick up a, big, a good part of these costs. And almost inevitably, that turns out to be the federal government in a lot of people's minds. I wonder how many people are looking closely at the fiscal health of the federal or provincial governments 
and the long list of other priorities that those governments face, whether it be health care, social welfare, infrastructure, national defense. Business leader, leaders often argue the government should rely less on sticks, otherwise known as regulations, and more on carrots, otherwise known as subsidies, maybe. But a realistic look at the backyard will tell us that there are only so many carrots and that there are a lot of rabbits. Business leaders need to be asking their governments to take a hard look at the carrot patch and ask themselves just how realistic it will be for governments to subsidize millions of individual energy users to convert their energy systems, and all of that in just over 20 years. And so to the last theme. We know quite a lot about the technology that will have to underpin the energy transition. Much of it exists, at least in principle, whether it be wind, solar, storage, hydroelectric grant dams, small modular reactors, hydrogen production, or carbon capture and sequestration. But a lot, a lot of this still needs to be proved at scale, and we know from experience that that all takes time. And back to the question of public acceptance, get ready for all sorts of unpleasant surprises when new facilities are proposed. The point here is that knowing about technology is not enough. There is a long list of constraints that policymakers have to take into account, most of which I've tough touched on but are worth summarizing. Capital is limited everywhere, and all investors, whether governments, businesses, or individuals, have many priorities. The current debate so far is, uh, is choosing to largely ignore this point, and we have to stop ignoring it. New technologies don't always work the way we expect, at least not the first time around. Think about the LRT in Ottawa, and there are lots of other examples. We are going into a long process of learning, and a lot of it will be painful. Can we at least consider the idea that we may be more likely to succeed with incremental change and lots of small mistakes that we learn from and hopefully avoid either massive unexpected costs or worse, catastrophic failures in the energy system? And finally, people and their behaviors are always a surprise, and sometimes, but not always, uh, an unpleasant one. I mentioned the mistakes of oil forecasters, one of which was greatly misunderstanding or underestimating what people would do about energy efficiency in the face of high costs and worries about supply security. That was a pleasant surprise. But surprises go the other way, too, and we are well advised uh, to uh, and to anticipate them. So to conclude, what we actually know about the energy systems of 2050 is very limited. That should both give us, give us, both give us pause and inspire us to learn more as quickly as we can, sharing the learning and experiment. And I'm noting some of the conversation earlier this morning talking about the sharing among uh, uh, people advocating for uh, uh, downtown improvement it's exactly what we need to be doing on, on uh, energy uh, among communities. The planet wants us to do something about greenhouse gas emissions, and so we should, and sooner rather than later. But the very same planet is inhabited by lots of unpredictable people, and policy needs to be much better at understanding that fact. We need to be ambitious, but we need to couple that ambition with realism some of that ambition and a lot of realism can come from business groups such as yours. Business people know more about is actually, what is actually happening on the ground than any policymaker can possibly know. That puts them in a position to offer positive, constructive, and pragmatic advice. And I wish the Ottawa Board of Trade uh, good luck in, uh, in your coming efforts to do just that. So thank you very much.